All right, good morning. Welcome to our Gatorade booth this morning. I, my name is Kim Stein. I am a scientist at the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. I have the privilege this morning of moderating the panel. I get the easy job. I just get to ask questions. You get to hear from our experts this morning. So um, we're going to be talking this morning about concussion um, and the evolution of safety protocols and, and some of the work they do to help keep their athletes safe and specifically around the concussion issue. So we have with us this morning Jeff Kaplan from the Houston Texans and Chris Peduzzi from the Philadelphia Eagles and down on the end is Rick Burkholder with the Kansas City Chiefs. So join me in welcoming our staff Thank to you. our panel today. Um, these guys are part of the PFATS group and they are very busy here at NATA so we really appreciate you taking the time to spend a half hour with us this morning. <clears throat> Um, we're going to start off with Rick down on the end. And Rick, can you tell us about the evolution of concussion protocols in the NFL over about the last five years or so? Yeah, so that, that word protocol is even my 13-year-old uh, daughter, anytime she falls down, she's in the protocol. So protocol is such a, a big word. But I think, I think as, the, as this thing's evolved, the, the biggest issue in the National Football League, and not specifically with what we take a player through, but... In the NFL right now, we don't want to change our game so much that it's not our game anymore. People watch our game because they like to see people be hit and tackled. But um, through all of us at, at the National Football League and, and individual teams, we have an electronic medical record system that we enter data. And then Quintiles is a statistic group. They um, synthesize that, and then they make rule changes. So in about the last eight years, we've had 48 rule changes for player safety in the National Football League. And our, our big deal is that we're trying to take the head out of the game but still make it tackle football. So um, a lot of what we've done is, is, is try to take the head out of the game. And then on our end, once they do get a concussion, the protocol evolves every year. So we have um, mandatory video on the sideline that we have to look at. We have um, the, the latest SCAT program that we have to take them through. Uh, we're, we've evolved into medical tents this year, so a lot of what you've seen in the past you won't see on the sideline because if we suspect a concussion, um, we're going to take them into medical tent and do the go, no-go stuff. And then if we have to continue the protocol, we're going to take them inside. So it, it has evolved, but it's... Um, that word protocol is almost nasty in our league mm -hmm. right now, but it's, it's not. And, and I think the National Football League is doing a phenomenal job of taking the head out of the game, but keeping the game still a collision sport that everybody wants to see. Thank you, and that was a great introduction to kind of set, a, set us up for the day. Um, Rick, we're going to stick with you for the next question. What do you do to get a player back on the field after concussion to ensure full recovery and optimal return to play? Yeah, so, I, you know, I've been in it so long. We, we used to put them in a dark room now not in a closet on a bike but uh we you know rest was our big deal and we've gotten away from that we, we're now very exercise oriented with them and um we, we've gotten really detailed in in our rehabilitation so we're really looking at um vestibular ocular motor rehab because we we were finding out that so many of our players felt okay but their their um two things were happening to them one is their fine motor skill was off so I had Michael Vick in, in Philadelphia when I was there, and, and he felt okay. He told us he was okay. He passed all the protocol stuff, and all his balls were up in the air. You know, they, they, he was off. He was hitting guys in the feet. And the one thing that I talked to Mike about was I, I said, do you experience anything different? Because you're doing fine, but you're not doing fine. He said, I get terribly tired watching film. Well, we realized that his eyes weren't tracking, right, you know, so he was working independently. So we've added that whole, whole deal into our, our – um, into our protocol and rehabilitation. We're much, much more detailed than we've ever been with, with rehabilitation of concussion. You two have anything to add? Concussion? Same with us. Okay. We're doing the same thing with all the eye tracking. That, that's the, in talking, we, we do a lot with, uh, at UPMC with Mickey Collins, mm -hmm. and uh, that's, that's who we deal with with reading our impact tests and things like that. And that's the, that was the missing piece, I think, and you guys add in too, and I know Rick has already alluded to that, but with the, all the vestibular and the eye tracking, is uh, in, in years ago we weren't really using that and, and adding that into their rehab and recovery, but we're doing all the eye tracking things now. I mean, I, I think the one piece that I, I take away is a concussion rehab is, is really no different than 
ACL rehab that we've been doing for the last 25 years. We're just, we're not as far, as far along as we are with knee rehab. We've been dealing and researching ACLs and proper protocols and rehab and surgical techniques and all that stuff for 25, 30 years. I mean, 25, 30 years ago, maybe even 40 years ago, they put a guy in a cast after ACL rehab. But now we want to move them right away. We want to get them weight-bearing right away, get their quads firing right away. So concussion rehab and the concussion protocol, it's evolving. It's changing. We're putting millions of dollars into research every year. And it's no different than any other body part or any other thing that we've evolved over the years. What we're doing now is different than what we did five years ago, different than what we did 10 years ago, because we know so much more. So I think everybody has to look at it that way. Thank you. Um, Jeff, we're going to go down to you. Um, when you're evaluating a concussion, symptoms of dehydration could be similar to some of the symptoms of concussion. How do you differentiate the two, or do you look at hydration status at all when you're evaluating a concussion? So, so you guys being in Houston for a few days, you realize <laughs> we, we live and work in the tropics. Uh, usually, when we're practicing, the heat index is around 110, 120. So we're outside practicing, and you're right, a lot of the symptoms are very similar. So the number one thing we always ask them or talk to them or look at is, was there a head collision? Mm -hmm. Did you get hit in the head? Because a lot of the symptoms can be very similar. Headache, fatigue, nausea, disorientation, dizziness, a lot of the similar symptoms. Um, so if there was no impact, if there was no head collision, we'll deal with the dehydration stuff first mm -hmm. and get them in a cool area, hydrate them. We're very uh, aggressive with all different forms of hydration in, in Houston and uh, trying to do things proactively because if you're reactive in Houston, you don't make it through practice. So we do mm -hmm. things very proactively when mm -hmm. it comes to that. But the, the biggest thing is we always look for a, a collision or a contact injury to the head to kind of differentiate and do a differential diagnosis. Makes sense. I don't know how you guys do it. Y'all were like me, I'm sweating walking over here to the convention it's, center. The, the weather is beautiful this week, too. I mean, this is uh, a beautiful week for Houston. <laughs> hey, Good to know. Hey, Kim, <laughs> one, one thing that I think is interesting is when these guys have a concussion, they, they get out of their normal lifestyle. So they're very tired. They sleep more. They're not, they, they may not be in meetings. So they're, they're, their routine that they get out of. So... We have, we have very strict um, dehydration protocols at, at the Chiefs, and I know the, the Eagles do too because I was with Chris for so long. Um, so if you have a muscle injury or you're a chronic cramper, you're in our dehydration program, which um, involves urine testing every morning for specific gravity and, and nutritional counseling and everything. If you're in our concussion protocol, you automatically get put into our dehydration protocol mm -hmm. because we're finding that those guys that are concussed, they, don't, they, they lose that that normal so if they're if they're drinking seven eight nine gatorades in a day because they're sleeping so much and they're not in meetings they they get back to five and then all of a sudden they're dehydrated and they don't do as well in the rehab so we're, we automatically at our place your concussion protocol you're also dehydration protocol so and thanks for adding that because you basically answered my next question oh. for chris <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> was once they are concussed and they're recovering then from that how do you look at hydration or manage hydration during that time. So thank you, Rick. <laughs> Chris, do you have anything to add? I should exactly, yeah, <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's exactly right. We probably have, well, all, our, all of our guys, as Rick had said, in a, a, he, as he mentioned, with, uh, we probably have between 50 and 60% of our roster, either between guys that have muscle injury, you know, your muscle pool guys or dehydration issues that are in our hydration program. But then if they're not in that and they suffer concussion, then they automatically get into the hydration program. So that, it's the exact same thing that Rick mm -hmm. just alluded to with how we en enter them into the hydration program, making sure they're staying hydrated and getting their rest and things mm -hmm. like that. Great. Um, Chris, we'll stick with you for the next question. How do you work with the other Eagles practitioners in helping a an athlete come back from a concussion? Well, I'm sure uh, these guys will also probably allude to it, but... When, when any, with any type of injury with, with a concussion, they get the, it's the shotgun approach. Uh, anything and everything to get a guy better and as quickly and as safely as possible. Uh, we'll do everything from massage to uh, not only just the concussion protocol from they got to see the INC and the independent neurological consultant that ultimately ends up clearing them, our docs, but we'll do acupuncture, massage, our, our strength and conditioning guys working with them, getting back into, into the weight room and their normal workouts. Um, but everything and anything to get them back 
mm-hmm. with with uh, back right. through the protocol. And that kind of bleeds into our, our next question for you is, are there any other modalities? Um, we just mentioned a few of them, but any specific things that you use in concu- return from concussion that could include nutrition as well? So, I mean, there, there's a bunch of things we use. Uh, Chris alluded to, in the state of Texas, we can do dry needling. So we do a lot of dry needling around the suboccipitals, the uh, cerebral, I mean, the um, pa- cervical paraspinals, things like that, the traps, anything to decrease tension, headaches, things like that. Um, we use a very collaborative approach mm-hmm. between us, our nutrition staff, our, our sports nutritionists, our strength coaches, our physicians, and our athletic trainers and physical therapists on, on staff. So we, we meet every day. We, we put a, a plan together. We use heart rate monitoring mm-hmm. um, as part of our concussion protocol and our stair-step approach to, the, to their rehab. We use uh, different types of of modalities mm-hmm. um, to decrease any uh, soreness or, or stiffness that they have around their, their head and neck. Mm-hmm. We, we use a lot of different type of uh, visual rehab stuff, like, like you guys were alluding to, uh, vestibular rehab and balance rehab. We'll do a lot of stuff where they're walking and catching a ball and swiveling their head. We'll do a lot of stuff on the field later in the rehab process where they're, they're having to track balls or, or things like that. So mm-hmm. it's a very uh, interactive approach. We do a lot of balance training and a balance uh, testing and proprioceptive training during the concussion uh, rehab. So it's, it's a very interactive, collaborative approach between all the professionals involved. And we meet every day on a daily basis with us and the strength coaches, all the athletic trainers, and, and get a game plan together so everybody's on the same page working with these guys. Great. And you, and well, you, Dan? I, I think the one thing that we've all missed because we get so – focused in on the concussion, right? So we get rabbit holed in, concussion, what are we doing for the concussion? If these guys, if our players are getting hit hard enough or they're hitting the ground hard enough to be concussed, chances are they've got some kind of neck issue as well. And oftentimes when they're restricted in their motion, it decreases the blood flow. And once we correct that, everything kind of goes. So early in the process, we do a lot of soft tissue work on their neck. As Jeff said, we, we can dry needle in... Um, in Kansas City, and I think dry needling is great because I think it bypasses a lot of the steps that we've taken to get to the, the point where we're trying to break up that spasm. But we've, Jeff said it, we, we look at a lot, of, a lot of different things. We have our players captured, you know, it's their job. So I, I get my players in there at seven in the morning and I have some of them until seven at night. So you can spend a lot of hands-on time. And I think, I, I think it's the right thing to do. I also think it's why our, our return to play is a little quicker than everybody else because we have them captured. It's not that we're doing anything greater. We just have them captured. We have more time with them. And, and so longer. we're able to test their hydration. We're able to do their neck range of motion and soft tissue work and you chiropractic. Know, chiropractic, acupuncture. We have, you know, s- specialists in, in um, strength and conditioning that can really work with them. So I, I don't think our guys are, it's any different. It's just that we're with them more, you know, mm-hmm. and it's a luxury yeah. for us to be with them. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, I'm going to take a pause here and see if we have any questions from the audience. And if you do, you just have to shout them out, and I'll try and relay them. Mm-hmm. So you were talking about nutrition. We just, I was just in a um, conference about ketones. And, and it says, do you do any of, do you try the um, keto diet or um, anti-inflammatory in the brain? Were you guys able to hear that? Yeah. You so the question, s- so everyone could hear, is about ketosis and the ketone diet, and if they try anything related to that to c- decrease inflammation in the brain. So what the the things that we do at our place for anti-inflammatory via nutrition and, and supplementation is um, we uh, kind of adhere to a strict NFL policy of handing out no supplements. That's the NFL policy. So what we try to do is manage things through diet and through food supplementation. Okay, so tart, ter- tart cherry juice is something that we use a lot because it's known uh, anti-inflammatory. So we, we do that a lot. But well, the biggest thing is we, our guys at, at our level, um, when they're young, in their early 20s, terrible diet habits. Terrible diet habits. They're coming out of college. They have no idea how to cook for themselves. In college, everything's prepared for you. They have you know meal plans for them, a training table, all that stuff. You get to the pros. We have breakfast, we have lunch for them, but we don't have dinner for them except during training camp. So they got to figure out after they've been at work for 12 hours what to do for dinner. So what we try to do is teach them a, a well-rounded diet, okay? 
with proper, nutri nut tr proper nutrition. We don't, we don't do any of the ketosis stuff or anything like that. The important thing is to make sure they get plenty of protein, plenty of carbs, and the proper amount of fats, and try to teach them the proper nutrition. And then the mitigating factors with the anti-inflammatory stuff we throw in stuff with tart cherry juice, we recommend, we can talk about this, we, we recommend that they, they go out and get a, a, an approved um, omega-3 mm -hmm. and, and fish oils, get an approved supplement that we know is clean. So that's how we do it. Yeah, so uh, ketosis is a bad word at my place because we work those guys so hard, that's a disaster waiting to happen. So we, we agree with the anti-inflammatory part of it, but we're looking at, so our, our chefs are all organic. Um, we're doing some of the stuff with tart ch cherry juice and um, we're trying to take some of the simple inflammatory products like simple sugars and stuff out of their diet. But if we don't give our guys carbs, we're, we're sunk. Uh, so we can get them back from the concussion, then they're gonna pull a hamstring and miss six weeks anyway. So um, if, if, if ketosis comes up at our place, and it does, uh, that, that's, that's like dog cussing me. I, I, I get in their backside pretty good because they, they just, they're big, strong, lean men. They can't do that. They can't do it. And if you come into our place, and I know Jeff and, and Chris are the same way, if you come to camp next month and you need a ketosis diet for weight loss, you, you're not making our team. You're not making our team. It's, it's too competitive right now. And, and these guys, they're not big fat guys anymore. They are ripped, you know. And so uh, I, I don't disagree with the ketosis diet in, some situa in our situation. It can't happen. So I'm going to give you a personal story about ketosis diet. One of our offensive linemen two summers ago had to lose 10, 15 pounds between the end of OTAs and training camp to make his weight. Okay? So he left Houston, went away, got some recommendations by people who have nothing to do with football and don't understand the rigors of an NFL training camp. He did a ketosis diet for a month. He came and failed his conditioning test. We had a conditioning test here, 8 o'clock in the morning. The heat index is 110, failed his conditioning test, had to work his way into shape over the next week, 10 days. 10 days into training camp, strained his calf in six weeks. And it was all because of poor planning for training, for camp. training camp. Yeah. yeah. That, these guys, guys go, go ahead, but th these guys have to have carbs. They have to have carbs to compete. They have to have carbs to um, compete at a high level for muscle, for brain function. For brain function. Mm -hmm. So low, low carb diet at my place, I get up on my soapbox and I get really <laughs> mad because these guys can't function on low carb diets yeah. at all. We do the same thing as you guys were talking about, but with, and you were, as you talked about with poor diet that these guys have coming out, our nutritionists get with our guys, they take them to the, the supermarket, show them how to shop, show them things to look for. And then we have basically cooking classes for them how to make prepare meals for themselves the first we do that during the off season once the rookies come in and show them these different things and they and they actually end up with they started this year having a they did a chop class which was kind of comical to watch <laughs> with these rookies making it and they so that was pretty funny you know along the lines of of making weight for training camp and all that we have a very strict rule and i've been with my head coach for 19 years so he kind of does what we tell him and and he's a pretty heavy guy anyway but um we, we don't allow, so we weigh our guys in and out of every practice in training camp, and we do it for dehydration purposes. But our, co our coaches and our strength coaches, they're not allowed to get on our guys about weight in training camp. They're, they're, not allowed to, uh, they're not allowed to badger them. They're not allowed to look at the weight chart. They're not allowed to say, hey, I think you're too, because in our training camp, if they do that, those guys will find a source on Google or they'll call some expert. They'll lose so much weight that it'll be what Jeff says. They'll pull a calf, they'll pull a hamstring. And the interesting thing about it is everyone, and Chris, Chris can attest to this because we were together for 14 years, like 85% of our players that have muscle injuries, when we take them off the field, we try to urine test them, their specific gravity is horrible. And it's usually when we get to talking to them, like what happened? I slept through breakfast this morning or I'm trying to cut weight and it's a disaster. So we're... Uh, Preventative wise, like Jeff says, you want to see an athletic trainer in the National Football League get pissed off? Have somebody come to you and tell you that they're on a ketone diet. <laughs> well, here's the other thing, too. In, in our situation, 50 to 75% of our guys show up at 6 o'clock in the morning dehydrated. Right. Dehydrated. So if you go out on the field in Houston dehydrated, number one is you're going to make it 20 minutes in practice, and you're either going to have heat illness or you're going to be hurt. You're going to be dizzy, lightheaded, throwing up, 
20 minutes, or you're going to get a soft tissue injury. So, so we, we're fighting that all the time, all the time. And yeah. then, it, then that just it, – it's the, the effect of then all of a sudden the next posi- – at that position, more guys taking reps at the same position. The snowball it's, effect. It's snowball effect. It's, then you're like, oh, God. And, then, and if there are injuries at a certain position, then, it's, and then you're like, oh, God, here we go. So that's a good idea that, that Rick had at, at his place. So if, if a guy needs to lose weight, what's the number one thing they're going to do to lose weight quick? Stop drinking. Dehydrate themselves. So now they're going to have poor mental performance, poor physical performance, and have a huge increased risk of injury. Yeah. I mean, it's a something. mess. So when Chris and I were together in Philadelphia, we, we, had, we did some research, and, and um, we actually brought researchers in. And this is an interesting fact, and this is for everybody who's gone to football camp here in the next month. So between days three and day nine of training camp, we had our lowest levels of hydration and lowest levels of sodium content, okay? So we collected sweat and urine and everything, body weights. Day three through day nine, they drop out drastically. It's not surprising that that's our highest time for muscle injury. Surgery. So the majority of our muscle injuries in a season are between day three and day nine in training camp, and it's also the lowest dehydration thing. So. You know, he and I aren't math majors. In fact, I'm not very smart. He's way smarter than I am. But we were like, okay, stop this madness. And we started pounding the hydration stuff. And now Maggie and her crew come to my training camp. And we test out. And, and, and we're better at it. We're not perfect. We're better at it. Because you, you lose track of players. You got knuckleheads, you know. And, and, and they, they, don't, they don't follow the protocol. But we try to stay on it. Excellent question. You obviously got them fired up. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any other questions from the audience? Nobody. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, so low tech, okay. cost effective ways, right? Let me interrupt you, you for a second so everybody can hear. Okay. The question was how, what advice do they have for high school athletic trainers? Particularly, you're from Alabama, right? But for all of you athletic trainers in the crowd, what advice do you have so for dealing with the number hydration? one thing is weigh in and weigh out before and after practice. A weight, you need to have weigh in before you start training camp. That's their baseline weight, okay? You can weigh in and out before every practice. And our, our basic rule of thumb is for every pound you lose at practice, drink one 20-ounce bottle of Gatorade. That's, that's our basic rule of thumb, okay? The thing you have to watch out for, at least in our environment, let's just say a guy starts at 200 pounds as baseline, okay? Next day before practice, he's 200. Next day, he's 199. Then he's 196. And he's still getting back to what he was at the beginning of practice, but every day or every other day, he's dropping his pre-practice weight. He's dehydrating as the week goes on. He's not getting back to where he was at the start of training camp. And that's, that's where you got to get back to. So to me, that's a quick and dirty way of preventing injuries, low-tech, cost-effective way, way in and way out, have them write down their, their weights on a chart. One, every pound they lose, one 20-ounce bottle of Gatorade. And add lots of extra salt, lots of food. extra salt to their food. Snacks, pretzels, peanuts, things that are salted. That's... At a high school level, to me, that's just the easiest yeah, way. That's the way to do well, it. My, my dad's a high school athletic trainer. We have this discussion all the time because he's got budget issues. And the one thing that I always emphasize to him, because we have the most elite players in the world, and you just heard about 20 minutes here of us just pure education of these players, teaching them. I mean, we go over the top where we teach them how to shop and cook. Those high school kids aren't going to do that. But you have parents, so you got to educate your parents because they're the ones that are preparing breakfast and at dinner and in some schools they're going home you know for lunch so you 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 educate the parents and then educate your coaches I know they're high school coaches and they think they know everything they don't they don't know anything so I I say athletic trainers are like the rule book in golf right like you can you can get penalized yourself for a stroke or you could figure out a way to gain strokes with that rule book right well you got to convince your coaches of that that you're not just a person that goes in there and says you don't have so-and-so as a wide receiver I can help you with performance, but they, you've got to take the time before you get to camp to educate them and the parents. Excellent. Any more questions from the audience? When you talk about um, vestibular rehab, do you differentiate what you do there um, as opposed to your uh, conditioning rehab when you're bringing a person back from a concussion? Like, do you, do you 
make separate time for each, or do you combine them together? Like the exercise, the, the kind of rehab you would do for for vestibular, um, you know, conditioning, I guess you could call it. Are those included in the same kind of exercises as your strength and conditioning rehab when you're bringing someone back from concussion, or do you differentiate those? Types? Yeah. So, so the question is, when we do vestibular rehab, is it similar to our normal rehab protocols? I think is what yeah, you're asking. Sure. So, I'm I'm not a cookbook guy, so I take every situation separately. And certainly even players in the National Football League all have weaknesses. I always think when they're with us in the athletic training room, we can actually help their performance because we can work on weaknesses that they don't work on. So I tailor make it to whatever the player is So and by position. So some of the stuff that we do in, in the vestibular rehab, once we get them to more of a functional level, um, I, I almost go back to what I do in the off season with those guys when I try to do corrections with them. So I may have a left tackle. I may have a left tackle that's, that's right leg heavy, right? And when I get him in vestibular rehab, I, I take that time to not only correct his balance issues, but try to improve on it before we put him back out there. So I, I don't know. I, 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 know you guys, I know you guys well. Every situation's different, and that's why we meet as a group. I, I have seven certified athletic trainers in season. We meet as a group and talk about, hey, what would you do with this guy? We share ideas, and then we tailor it to that person's program. So I'm, I'm a little old school and a little egotistical and a little uh, protective. I don't turn my guys over to the weight room too often. <laughs> we would tailor it to their symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we do a very similar. Um, I, I think it, it's, it's very hard. At, at, at the beginning, it's very easy to kind of pick out the little rehab exercises, but as they progress through, to me, it's very hard to pick out the difference between a guy doing rehab and strength and conditioning. It's very blended at, at our place. And three of our athletic trainers are also strength and conditioning specialists, so we have a, ver a very uh, diverse athletic training staff at our place with a lot of knowledge, and I'm the same way a as Rick is. We take a lot of pride in taking our guys from beginning to end. And we will use our strength coaches for certain things, um, especially working on areas that we're not concentrating on. If, it's, if, we're, if a guy's got a lower extremity injury, we'll give him the upper and we'll take care of the lower. And most of the time, we're doing more core stuff than they're doing because we have more time with them. We know their deficiencies a little bit more. We know their medical history. After a guy's in the NFL a few years, they all have stuff. They all have stuff. They all have ways that we have to work around things mm -hmm. and add specific exercises and it's a great opportunity like rick said to kind of take a step back and hone in for a couple weeks on some things we were doing a few months ago that maybe kind of got lost in the shuffle of of the season or training yep. camp yeah i think one of the interesting thing was things with our players is the thing that separates those those players from normal football players is they're all big and they're all fast but their proprioception and balance is unprecedented so as, as the providers of that, and, and when we have, to re we have to be really, really creative. I have a 260-pound outside linebacker that can stand on a Swiss ball and lift weights. So me doing a little bit of air, you know, air mat balance with him, that ain't cutting it. He can do that. He, he can do that with his eyes closed in his sleep. And so I certainly wouldn't put him back on the ball with a, with a barbell in his hand if he had a concussion, but I've got to work up to that point. So... And then I got guys that are coming from the colleges that are terribly weak in their core. So if I do too much proprioception and their core fails, we fail in the exercise. So you got to tailor it a little bit. And, and listen, we're, we're very blessed. We work with genetic freaks. These guys are, the things that they can do, they amaze me. Every year, those guys amaze me. Like, they amaze me. I got a guy that runs, I got a guy that runs in a game, was clocked at 23.9 miles an hour. My treadmill only goes to 12. I mean, what, what am I going to do with them, right? Like, we've got to get – Jeff, They're wired Chris, you've you, you got to get really creative in your rehab. So you can't, can't have a cookbook. That's what's fun about our job, why, why I don't want to leave. I, I get challenged with those guys. I love it. Great. So we're going to wrap up with one more question. We had a question of um, your advice to high school athletic trainers around heat and hydration. What would your advice be to high school athletic trainers, maybe small college athletic trainers that don't have a lot of resources at their disposal in terms of diagnosing and helping their athletes come back from concussion? Go ahead. Don't, don't be scared of them. 
I mean, that's the one thing that uh, one conference we had at, at PFATS was uh, Dr. Collins came to speak to us from PFATS. They're like any other injury. I mean, it, it, the media, in, in my opinion, wants to make it out to where it's the boogeyman. I mean, it's like any other injury. Uh, treat with your eyes. I mean, like, see what you see and, and treat it like any other injury, but don't be scared of them. Um, Take your time with them like you would with an ACL or an ankle sprain or anything else. Be smart with it like you would with any other injury. But it's not it, – it, I think the media makes it out to be like, oh, my God, somebody has a concussion, they're going to be brain dead. No. it's If you treat it right and be smart with it, you're going to be okay. Um, it, I think it's – that's it, I can get on my soapbox here, so I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think one thing I, I try to preach to a lot of secondary school athletic trainers and even uh, – people that take care of middle schools and, and youth programs is is you can't compare the concussions that they get in the NFL level with, with what they get in high school. It's it's a mature brain and an immature brain. So it's it's not fair to compare how fast we got we get guys back or or all the resources that we have. Um, I, I also think that we all need to be a little more cautious nowadays and stand our ground and educate coaches, educate overzealous parents and and if it looks like a fish and smells like a fish, it's, it's a fish, right? So we all are very educated athletic trainers. If, if, if you are suspicious of a concussion, then it's a concussion until you prove otherwise. Yeah, I, I have a little different approach to the whole concussion thing. I think this, this concussion crisis we have in, a, in this country right now is the greatest thing to have in athletic training ever because it's created jobs. It's created awareness that there's these professionals called athletic trainer that are the lifeguards of our game. And so with that in mind, if you believe that theory that it's the best thing that ever happened to our profession, then as professionals, we need to embrace that because that's how we're gonna be judged by the other healthcare communities, by parents, by athletic directors, the people who hire us. And I can tell you, even at our level, if we screw up a concussion, right? We're gonna be in the news, we're gonna be in the media. I've been there, I've screwed them up and I've been in the media, but if you do it right, you're going to be a hero, and you're going to create jobs. So even in the National Football League, one of my screw-ups was I let a guy go back and play because I didn't see it. So how would that create jobs? Well, we now, have, we now have like 90 ATC spotters in the National Football League. So my screw-up created jobs. And I think the silver lining of this thing, and everyone's scared, oh, this concussion crisis. No, it's great for our profession. It's making us who we are. It's putting us out in the forefront of athletic health care. So embrace it because it's really important for the future of our profession. If we handle this right, we'll have all kinds of jobs, and that 37% that's covering high schools right now will turn into 67%. All right. Well, we have taken up our full time here. Thank you so much for spending part of your busy NATA with us this morning. Thank you all uh, for attending. We have a great crowd here. This was great fun. So join me in thanking our speakers this morning. Yep, no problem. Thank you, guys.